We are in the book of Acts chapter 22, and um, we're moving right along. I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't sure how quickly we would move through the book of Acts. In fact, chapter 23, uh, in chapter 22, Paul is still in Jerusalem. He's still facing a, a riot, and there's a lot of things going on. We'll be looking at some of that tonight. But in chapter 23, he, is, he goes into the sea uh, side of Caesarea. And he'll be there in the 23rd chapter all the way to chapter 27. And from there, he'll launch forth to Italy on his way to Rome in chapter 27 and 28. So, and the book of Acts only has, of course, 28 chapters. So we're getting close. I'll just give you the outline so you can see this. And uh, we're going to begin reading the first five verses of chapter 22. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word in the book of Acts. Amen. And um, it says, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. Now notice in verse 2, this is important that you see this in parentheses. And when they heard that he spoke Hebrew, spoke in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept a more silence. In other words, they listened. And he saith, verse 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarshish, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of our fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day, zealous just like you are. And I persecuted this way, that's the Jesus way, unto death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, uh, from the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound to Jerusalem for to be punished. Then he gives his testimony of what happens on the, the Damascus road in verse 6 and, and concludes in verse 20 and 21. And so what I'm going to do is preach his testimony, and then we'll move quickly through this chapter and let the Lord speak to our hearts. Before I have you seated, of course, some of you have already been seated, but before I have you seated, I want to make this statement because it's important that you see this. Paul has just been rescued from a riot. Some Jews in, from Asia in Ephesus stirred up a horrific riot, and a chief captain rescued him and took him in the stairway. When you think of stairs, don't think of stairs like at your home. Think of stairs, elaborate stairs, and they called it a castle in the temple. And he was taken there, and while they were just bloodthirsty to kill Paul, Paul says to the captain, the soldier, the Roman soldier, in Greek, let me talk to the people. And the captain couldn't believe that he could speak Greek. And then he turned around in the stair, and he spoke Hebrew. Paul could speak five different dialects, Greek and Hebrew being two of those. As he speaks to them, not everything goes well. Kind of like pastoring. As you speak, not everything goes well. I want to use for a subject tonight, what, wait, what did I say? What, wait, what did I say? Have you ever got someone mad at you and you don't have a clue what you said? You ever had someone get upset at you and you don't have a clue why they got upset at you? And you're thinking, what? Wait, what did I say? Well, that's kind of how Paul is tonight in this situation. You may be seated. Paul is, of course, he spoke to the captain in Greek. The captain was a Greek. You say, how do you know he was Greek? He's a Roman soldier. Well, I know he was Greek by his name in verse 26 of chapter 23, Claudius Lysias. That's a Grecian name, and he knew Greek. And in fact, Claudius Lysias, this captain who rescued Paul, had bought and paid for his Roman citizenship. 
and that will come up a little bit in the message in just a few minutes, that he paid dearly for his Roman citizenship. You say, well, if he's Greek, wasn't he Roman? Not always. That, that there are two divisions, and this man paid dearly to become a Roman citizen. And Paul could speak in Greek, and he could speak in Hebrew. And when he spoke to the captain, the Roman captain, um, actually one over a, probably a troop of a hundred soldiers, he spoke to him in Greek, and that gave confidence to the captain, the chief captain, to listen to Paul. And so they stopped on the stairway or the castle. It was an elaborate stairway there at the temple. And Paul began to preach to them and share with them why he was the way he was. Have you ever tried to explain to someone why you are the way you are? Only mama understands that, right? And God. And Paul is trying to say, this is, I am what I am because of Christ. This is what happened to me. And so in his defense, he's declaring it, and he begins in verse um, 2, he speaks to the people in Hebrew. The Hebrew Jewish people there at the temple, when he begins to talk in Hebrew, they just got real quiet. He got their attention because he's speaking in Hebrew. And it just blows their mind that he could speak in Hebrew. And he told them right up front, I'm from Tarshish. I'm a Jew. He didn't tell him he was of the tribe of Benjamin, but he was. Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't, doesn't say it here, but he was from Tarshish. He grew up in Tarshish, and before he was fully grown, he went to Jerusalem. And he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, and they all knew who Gamaliel was. He was a professor, a great theologian of that day. And he said, I sat at his feet and learned the perfect law the law of Moses, and I was a Jew, a very um, devout Jew like you are this day, he was saying to them. Jo Paul was a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Jew of the Jews. He was more Jewish than the Jews were. He was more, uh, he was more full of theology and the th law of Moses than the, the bigots that tried to put him to death. He was a man of great wisdom, a scholar, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. He knew his stuff. But how, how many of you know that knowing your stuff don't always get you out of trouble? Amen? Sometimes knowing your stuff gets you in big trouble. And it got Paul in big trouble. But he's telling them that I was a Jew. I am a Jew. I sit at the feet of Gamaliel. I'm just like you, full of zeal. I love Moses. I love the law. I love the things of the law. And he's trying to bring to the people, the Jewish people that wanted to kill him, the truth about what happened to him. And so when he speaks in Hebrew, it gets everybody's attention. They get quiet. Notice in parentheses, they got quiet, silence. And they stayed silent through his whole testimony. Paul gives his testimony, what happened to him when he was on the road to Damascus to persecute the, the, the Christians in this way or this living way. He tells a story about how he fell to the ground and how a light appeared at noon and blinded him. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He calls him by his Hebrew name, Saul, Saul. And later he's given a, a, a Gentile name a Roman name, Paul, because he's going to be the apostle Paul to the, to the Gentiles. And so he tells this story about his conversion. Let me say this quickly. If you're telling a lost person about your conversion, unless the Holy Spirit is bearing that in their heart, they'll never understand what you're saying. They, they may understand some of the words, but they'll never feel what you're saying. They'll never know what you're saying. Because salvation is not something that you hear about and get skilled on. Salvation is something that you experience. And only the Holy Ghost can give you that experience. And Paul tells them about an experience he had. And in his defense, he's telling them, this angry mob, they're quiet, they're silent, they're listening. And he's talking about, I was a Jew of the Jews. 
I had papers, and even your leaders will tell you that I got papers to go to Damascus and persecute the, the people in this way, that living way in the church. And I was guilty of holding the coats and the garments of, of those who stoned to death the first martyr of the New Testament church, Stephen. And I went, and on my way to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and going against them, on my way, that Damascus road, I met up with King Jesus. I was on my way to persecute the church and bring people back to Jerusalem for, for punishment and to bring affliction upon them, both men and women and children. I was going to bring great devastation to people in this way. But Paul said, while I was on my way, while Saul was on his way, Jesus Christ knocked him to the ground. A great light came at noonday and began to blind him, and he fell on the ground. And Jesus Christ said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And Jesus, uh, and Saul speaks up and says, who are you, Lord? I mean, you know, if you got knocked to the ground, you'd probably say, Lord, who are you? He knew whoever he was, he was in charge, not Paul. Paul knew he wasn't in charge. He knew whoever knocked him to the ground was in charge. And I think it shocked Saul when he heard, I am Jesus. Why are you messing with me? Basically, that's what Jesus was saying. Saul, why are you messing with me? Why are you persecuting me? When you afflict my, my brothers and sisters, when you afflict my, my children, you are persecuting me. And Saul is smitten blind for three days. He's led like a child. A child leads him in the blindness back to Damascus. And he goes to Damascus. And there he's blind for three days. He's praying. And a vision comes to Ananias, a man there in Damascus, probably over a little church there. And God says to Ananias, go down to the to the uh, a, a place called Straight, a street called Straight. There's a man praying there. His name is Saul. And he prays. And I want you to go down there and I want you to heal him and tell him about all the things you will suffer because of what you've done against me. And Ananias went down there and said, you know, he said to Jesus, first of all, I don't want to do that. Have you heard of this mean guy? Amen. It's kind of like, God, don't you know what's going on? Yeah, God knows what's going on. You know, and he said, I've heard many things about this man persecuting the church. And, and, and Jesus Christ said, you go on down there. He's waiting on you. He's praying. And Ananias walks into where Paul is in that dark room. He cannot see. And Ananias says, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me. Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me. And Ananias lays hands on him. He's, he's healed. The scales fall off his eyes. He's, he gets his eyesight back. And then Saul gets up and is baptized. Water baptized. And it's changed gloriously by the power of God. He went out into the wilderness, spent some time, came back to Jerusalem where James was. He wanted to see Peter. He went and saw Peter. Then he came back to see James and went back to Jerusalem. And while he was in Jerusalem, I'm, I'm sharing with you the things that he was telling these people in Hebrew. He said, when I got to Jerusalem, I had a vision. And the vision said basically this from God. They'll never accept your testimony here. They will never accept you in this city. They are angry and they will kill you. Get out of the city. I'm going to make you and send you out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's when the silence broke. That's when they got angry. Because when Paul said, you know, they listened to his testimony being saved, being changed by the power of God. But when he said, I had a vision in Jerusalem and God told me to get out of there, they won't accept your testimony. He said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Notice what it says 
They won't receive your, verse 18, this is the, look at verse 17 to 22. And this will show you what I'm talking about. So it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, make haste, get out, get out quickly, quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of, his, uh, of them that slew him. God is saying, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. They, they're going to come after you. Verse 21, and he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. That was, the, that was where Paul would say, what? Wait. What did I say? Everybody was listening until he said, God sending me to the Gentiles. Now it's hate time again. They blow up, they ignite, and they're angry, and they have a fit. Notice verse 22, and they gave him audience unto this word, meaning they listened to that point. And when they heard that Paul was going to go to the Gentiles, how I many know religion can be ugly, mean, and just absolutely horrifying? Religion can be brutal. Amen? I met some preachers that are so full of religion that they're unkind. They're brutal. They, they hold a hard iron fist over their congregation. You know, preachers that have almost made their congregation slaves to his commands or her commands. And God never intended it to be so. We are free in Christ. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Religion is brutal. In fact, religion is what crucified Jesus on the cross of Calvary. In fact, religion is why most wars broke out, at least up until World War I and on. Now, because when they, when they listened to me, they gave audience and tell this word. What? What word? That God was sending me to the Gentiles. And then lifted up their voices and said, Away with this fella from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. That's what they said about Paul. It's not fit for you to live in verse 22. Why? Because he was going to go share the gospel with Gentiles. You talk about religious hate. You talk about bigot hate. In verse 23, And they cried out and cast off their clothes. They ripped their clothes off. Threw dust in the air. Only religion does that. Well, my grandsons do in the dust, you know, in the sand pile, but that's not religious. Hello? Come on, crack a smile. You look like a bunch of prunes out there. Listen to what God's saying. Amen. They threw dust in the air. They, they, and the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle. The chief captain says... We need to find out why they're so upset about him. Verse 24, and they bade that he should be examined by scourging. So basically what the chief captain was saying, okay, this Paul guy has got people so upset. This Paul guy, this, this apostle Paul guy, look at verse 25, and as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. And so they're saying Paul's effect on these people are so, is so devastating. They're throwing dirt in the air. They're, they're, they're falling into a riot. And so the Roman soldier thinks, well, we'll you know, he, this, this Paul guy's got some, he must, this man must have some dark secrets. And so we're going to beat those secrets out of him. We're going to torture him to tell us why they're really mad. See, the Romans didn't understand that these people were just really mad because they were religious bigots. They were full of hate. They felt like that their religion was the only one. They didn't want to accept the fact that God so loved the world. They just wanted to accept the fact that God so loved 
them, just their group. But God so loved the world, and so they got kind of a religious bigotry. But the Roman soldiers didn't understand that because they thought there's no way that people get this mad about what he said. So they're going to scourge him. They're going to beat him. Once again, what? Wait, what did I say? They're going to beat him. They're going to beat him to get the truth out. Aren't you glad that we don't get beat to get us to say the truth? Amen? Paul said the truth without being beat. I know some folks that I want to beat sometimes because I know they're lying to me. But, but Paul's about to get beat. They're going to tie him up. In fact, they did bind him. They're going to beat him. And Paul pulls out the old Roman card. Paul says, what are you going to do, beat a Roman citizen? What are you going to beat a, you're going to beat a Roman citizen? You're going to beat me, bind me, and beat me? It's against the law to beat a Roman citizen? And that's when the captain, guard, the soldier said, I paid a big price for my Roman citizenship. And Paul said, I didn't pay any price. I was born a free citizen of Rome. And so they decided then they better let the guy go because it was against the law of Rome to, to bind or execute any person, beat any person without just uh, authority going through the proper channels. Now, verse 30, chapter 22, on the mall, because he would, uh, he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews. This is the captain, chief captain. He loosed Paul from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. In other words, he called the Sanhedrin together. He called the chief priests together. The, the, the chief captain called the council together. And that brings me to my third and last point tonight. Paul had a very ugly council meeting. Amen? Sometimes Springfield has ugly council meetings. Sometimes Ozark has ugly council meetings. Shoot, sometimes churches that are not full of Jesus have ugly board meetings. We're not one of those. Our church is full of peace and full of grace. But Paul had a very ugly council meeting. The, the chief captain called everybody together, the council, the, the chief priests, the, the Jews, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees to get them together. They're going to listen. They're going to find out just what's going on with Paul. And so they're going to question Paul. Let's read down to verse 11, then we'll be done after I make a few comments or maybe many comments, I'm not sure. Chapter 23, and Paul earnestly beholding the council said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias, or Annas rather, Annas, the high priest, commanded them that they stood, them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Annas commanded them standing by to slap Paul in the mouth. And Paul in verse 3 said unto him, God, I'll smite you, thee, thou whited wall. Well, I don't know exactly what he meant by thou whited wall, but I don't think it was nice. I mean, it, Paul, said, Paul said, God, I'll smite you, thou whited wall. I got an idea that wasn't a very nice gesture. For he sitteth thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And then someone that stood by, verse 4, said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Are you rebuking God's high priest? Verse 5, Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou should not speak evil of a ruler of thy people. And when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee the son of a Pharisee. And he says, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, 
there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither is there angels nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. There is angels and spirit. And there arose a great cry. And the scribes that were uh, with the Pharisees part. I love this. And there arose a great, verse 9, there arose a great cry. And the scribes that were of the Pharisees uh, part, they rose up and strove against the, the Sadducees. And they said, we, we find no evil in this man. You know, Paul's a pretty good guy after all. But if a spirit of an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into piece, pulled in, uh, pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by the fort by force and among them, and to bring him under the castle, meaning that elaborate stair. And the night falling, the Lord stood by him. God says to Paul, and says, "Be of good cheer, Paul." For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. I love this. I just love this. Paul gets a group of people together in this ugly council meeting. And it dawns on him, half of these people are Pharisees and half of these people are Sadducees. And, the half of the, and they're both very religious and Paul's thinking, you know what? I think I can do something here. And Paul decides, I'll get them fighting between each other. Paul says, I'm a Pharisee. And the other Pharisees say, amen, amen. Paul says, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in angels. I believe in the spirit. And they said, amen. Hey, there's nothing wrong with this guy. Let him go. And the Sadducee says, no, 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 no. We don't believe in resurrection. We don't believe in angels. We don't believe in any of that. And so they start fighting each other. Amen. They were going to kill Paul, but he gets them fighting each other. So they get so caught up in their own fight that Paul just slips away with the captain of the, so the guard, the, slips away with the, the, the captain soldier. Isn't that beautiful? Did you know, I, you know, I see people get angry about things. Um, like on Facebook. You can mention on Facebook, you believe in pre-trib. And boy, there'll be a mass of swarms of flies come against that statement and say, no way, I believe in mid-trib. I say, no, 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 I believe in a post-trib. Everybody fights over it. Amen. Sometimes someone gets on there and says, I believe in hell. Someone else says, I don't believe in hell. So you got the hell mongers and the non-hell mongers. You got people all upset. You say, well, I think it's okay to drink a little wine. Then you got all the sober people fussing with the winos. You know, people can be high strung. If you really want to get an angry mob going, just make a statement on social media that you really, it's not necessary to go to church. And boy, the Sadducees will swarm. And the Pharisees will swarm. And one side will say, how dare you to make little of the church? And everyone says, bless God, you can be a good Christian. I've yet to find a good Christian that did not live in a nursing home or in the hospital I've, I, it's been hard for me to find a good Christian that isn't in physical dire need or in a nursing home or in a hospital. I, I've had a hard time finding a good Christian in good health that doesn't go to church. Amen. And see, that gets you riled up. Paul knew how to get them round up. He got the Pharisees. And the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees did. And uh, you know what? I'm sure you've heard this before. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection or angels or raising from the dead. That's why they were sad, you see. Amen. 
Amen? Well, pray tell me, if you don't believe in healing, you don't believe in resurrection, you don't believe in life after death, you don't believe in angels, you don't believe in miracles, why are you even bothering to go to church? If you don't believe in miracles, if you don't believe in healing, why do you even bother to pray? Say, well, if I pray, it makes me feel better. Well, I can go get a ping, a ping pong machine and play it and feel better. What do they call them, pinball machines? How many remember the pinball machines? Some of you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. The pinball, the pinball machines are pretty cool. If I'm in a slant, you know, and you get your little, little four silver balls or five silver balls come out there, you put a quarter in it, and it rolls out there, and you point, got a spring on you, and it goes up in these, this little lighted area, and, and, and Chris is learning something new not right now. She so got a clue what I'm talking about. And them little balls will go down and hit a little light and ping, and then it'll bounce over to another ping, and then it'll bounce over to another ping, and then each ping, ping, ping makes a, uh, uh, makes a number. Either 100 or 500 or 1,000. If you hit the really small ping, you get 10,000 points. Man, if you can just get it going and you get frustrated and you start beating that thing and pushing that thing, trying to make it do what you want it to do, there was a big light went across the screen. Tilt. <laughs> Game over. Amen. <laughs> Well, that's what happened with Paul and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The game was over. I remember, how many know one of them? I'm going to teach you how to cheat on a pinball machine. You already know. I can look at Don and know he's cheated a thousand times. Joel, if he knows what one is, he's cheated. I want an honest show of hands. How many ever cheated on a pinball machine? Honest show of hands. Okay, we've got about seven scoundrels in the room. I'm included. Let me tell you, let me tell you how to beat a pinball machine. I know it tilts, but if you'll be real easy and you'll get that little ball to go up and just be real easy and put your toe under the leg so that that little ball will go against the little notch where it goes into the notch that adds up and you get that little silver ball hung on that little notch. And they go, ting, 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 and it just racks up games. Bang, 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 bang. And next thing you've got 50 free games to play. You say, I can't believe you're sharing this with us tonight. I can. It makes good preaching. <laughs> That's kind of what Paul did. He got them sideways with each other. And Paul just had them not, not, not on his feet. He had them under his feet. And they were going, ping, 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 ping. And Paul was going, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And the captain, the chief captain says, we got to get you out of here. And so they load him up and send him to Caesarea. And there in Caesarea, he's going to spend the rest of chapter 23, 24, 25, 26, and in 27, he's going to launch off to Italy from Caesarea. And the great stories we're going to hear about Felix, King Agrippa, what's the other fellow? I can't remember. Felix, Festus. <laughs> Anybody with the name Festus needs to be saved. But anyway... And if your name's Festus, you need to be saved. But anyway, <laughs> we hear all them stories. And, and how many excited about the book of Acts is pretty cool. It's awesome. See there, I did get through chapter 23, a piece of it anyway. And uh, I feel good about myself. I've already won 50 games tonight. Feel real good. Amen. Lyman's looking at me. You know what a pinball machine is, Lyman? You're a cheater, aren't you? You're not a cheater? You've been baptized. You're not a cheater. 
Well, I've been baptized, but I'm a cheater. It's been a long time ago. Trust me, I ain't even seen one. Well, I guess they got them on computer. I don't know. But anyway, but tilt. Hated it when it would do that. It went my quarter. Tilt. But that's the problem. We get under so much pressure, we tilt. And that's what happened with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They tilted. And Paul knew how to get out of trouble. Isn't that good? He knew how to get out of trouble. Now, down the road, he's not going to get out of trouble. But he's going to win most of Rome to Jesus from a Roman cell under arrest in Rome. Much of Rome was delivered to Jesus Christ and saved because Paul from a prison preached the gospel in Rome until he was executed by Nero. But not until God had, had the job done. Amen? Got God's news for you. You're going to last as long as God wants you to last. <laughs> Hear me? You're going to last as long as God wants you to last. And if you don't last, you didn't last. I mean, you lasted as long as God wanted you to last. I don't want to last any longer than God wants me to last. Because I'm sure to last longer than God wants me to last would be quite boring and very unfruitful. Amen? And so there's a reason why you're in the world. There's a reason why you're saved. And Paul did his job, stretched out into the world. Remember the book of Acts? Remember we shared in the first chapter, when in the chapter, it was from Jerusalem to Rome. Jerusalem to Rome. That's what the book of Acts is, from Jerusalem to Rome. Rome was the known world at that time. The gospel from Jerusalem to the end of the world. Stand with me. Hope you enjoyed tonight. I hope I created a great desire in you to go find a pinball machine. <laughs> Spend the rest of your week looking for a pinball machine. Amen? If I could find one that worked, I'd buy it and put it in the back. And, and unplug it and put a lock on the plug in when we're having church. With any pinging going on, it's going to be in here. Amen? We're going to give an invitation. I want to invite you to come talk to the Lord. You have a reason. You have a purpose. And you're going to last as long as God wants you to last. And then when it's time to go home, you'll go home. But not until it's time for you to go home. We all have a job to do. Altar's open. God's going to play and sing.